doodaring. Um, I never say I'm recording these things, it always freaks everybody out, but don't worry about it. Um, so I'll just go out the room to the toilet, no I'm not. Right, okay, so lights, good. Um, so, um, the, the, the area um, of research that Kathy wanted me to do, um, I felt was going to be really easy, because there was going to be loads of archaeology to research. Um, but then it started to get into loads of history I was having to wade through um, to get to the archaeology uh, and, and lots of sites associated with Alexander the Great seemed to, as I clicked on them, to give me weird viruses onto the computer. I have no idea why that is. Um, so I had to go through different angles and areas to do this research. So Alex, um, Kathy wants to know, that's how the archaeology of Alexander the Great City. By the end of today, you will have the place where Alexander the, the Great was buried, and the mystery of it, where it was buried, okay? And Alexandria, so good, so Alexandria, whatever. So we've got that link. So, so it was 20 cities constructed um, to honor Alexander the Great. Now they are not all constructed in the age of Alexander the, the Great's life, um, from uh, about um, 330 years um, BC to about 320 odd BC. So it, it, his, his reign on this planet was very, very short. And what he achieved was massive. Um, <laughs> but then the whole cat cat, the, the, uh, the whole thing, um, like a pack of cards, collapsed um, uh, after his wonderful conquests. Now, if you're like me, you look at the map of Alexander the Great's conquests and you think, actually, you know, it's not a massive area. Um, but it is a massive area. We're talking about India, Afghanistan, Iran. Uh, Turkey, Egypt, whole of Greece, um, Syria, all that. You know, it's a it's a huge area if you look here. But when you put it in the into the map of the world, it's not as big as Genghis Khan or and so on. But then again, uh, Genghis Khan and Gen uh, Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan didn't build massive cities. So um, uh, Alex Alexandria in Egypt was the most significant of these cities, um, north of north of Cairo, uh, and best represents Hellenism. Um, Greek culture, okay. Um, I never really liked that word Hellenism. It's not really specific, but Alexandria became the centre for Hellen Hellenistic culture, Greek culture, and trade um, throughout the Mediterranean world. Uh, Hellenism, uh, the uh, the spread and blending of Greek culture. Okay, so by the time um, by, by the time we get to uh, the 1820s and we get to the, the Rosetta Stone, we, we got Greek on it, you know, so uh, Greek was really um, important um, in spreading the culture of, um, of, of, of Greekness. Um, and if we, if we look a bit here, Alexandria had a museum, um, yeah, wonderful museum, it's a wonderful library that was burnt down by the Christians, um, that had preserved um, a document of every single written piece of work produced, not just in Europe and Asia, but much further, oh, sorry, yeah, not just in Europe and sort of um, Asia Minor, but also scripts that come, texts that come from the, the Chinese world as well. So um, I'm not saying we had anything from Central America there, eh, which would be a bit far out, but um, it, it was the policy to um, collect um, Aristotle, um, Homer, everything was there, one copy. Um, usually when people went out to make copies, they um, accidentally brought back the original and left a copy. But then, um, then, then that, that sort of shot itself in the foot because the library burnt down um, because the Christians didn't feel it was the, the right um, thing to have. The Muslims were blamed for it, but we know, know it's the Christians. So, um, so um, we've got... Um, We've got a wave of cities um, that, that, that seem to fall under the ilk of Alexander the Great. Um, he didn't have a, a massive army compared to some of the armies of the time, but he had a well-trained army, uh, which makes all the difference. Um, you send the British army into the war uh, into a war zone, and you send the American army into the war zone, and the, and the British army tendency to do better than the Americans. But let's not get political. It, it's training that counts. Mind you, we don't seem to have the decent weapons, do we? Um, anyway, um, Alexander the Great founded 70 cities, naming at least 20 after himself and one after his horse. Um, and 
we're going to look at about four examples. I'm not going to do 220, thank goodness. Um, and a lot, lots of the um, places that he's conquering um, had that idea of um, Hellenism uh, bestowed upon them. They, they become Greek, um, and then the Greekness remained. I don't know if um, when it says um, founding, if that we're taking over and then twenty founded. That's, I, I don't know. That, that's actually a bit wrong, actually. Um, but if anyone actually watched the film, um, the man who would be king. Right, that, that's a really good film because um, lots of the cities that he founded were in Afghanistan in that area, um, and they they called him Sakanda, um, and you've got Roxanne or Kowak or whatever, and all these were in the film, and there was a city that he went to, Sakanda Gaul, um, and it's all in the film, and there's a temple there, and you're thinking, why is there a Greek temple here? And you're thinking as a child. This is absolute nonsense. And then you do this research and it all links in to the researcher. It's, it was, um, was it a book by Rudyard Ru Kipling? Yeah. So all that's been researched. And yeah, we, we do have Greek cities in the middle of nowhere. So there you go. Um, in Afghanistan. Oh, sorry. It's not in the middle of nowhere, is it? Um, so um, when, when I say it doesn't look like a huge empire, it, it, it doesn't. If you compare it with... So the Roman Empire that would have had this huge swathe um, and the Chinese world over here. But if you sort of think about it in a great empire taking over all the major civilizers of the time, all the ones with technology, all the ones with influence, then it's a massively great empire because, you know, um, with all due respect to anybody in Africa, it, it, you know, you wouldn't have had there wouldn't have been much in Africa for him to have conquered. Um, there wouldn't, wouldn't have been much in this Arabian Peninsula for him to conquer. There'd be huge areas up here that there wouldn't have been anything. Okay, So this is conquering the civilised world. If we look this way, um, we do have nice civilisers, nice civilisers like the, the, the Phoenicians um, um, coming into their own and the Etruscans, but this is the huge area he's conquering. So we've got this this ancient world, the, the Egyptians, that, that it's bang under his control. Um, we've got the Persians' world bang under his control. We've, we've got big chunks of the, the Indian realms under his control, and, and all these sort of states. So, so it's, it's massively. Um, and, after, and, and basically, um, I like to say 10 years, actually, but say 12 years, this is what he managed to conquer. And he was away from Greece um, for 12 years. Um, never to return. Um, lots of his warriors did return, but lots of his warriors decided to stay where, where they were. Um, and his generals became the leaders of this landscape. But that's not Kathy's question. The question is about his cities. Um, and it, it's, it's that sense of, um, it's that sense of um, Hellenism um, and becoming Greek that spread. When I, whenever I used to go to tombs in Cyprus, he, used to, he always used to say, um, um, Chalcolithic, Copper Age, um, Hellenistic, and Roman. And I'm thinking, where the hell are the Greeks? Hellenistic is Greek. Um, so um, we, we're, looking, we're looking at a bit, bit of a, a map here. Um, and not all of this is going to be, um, not all of this is going to be in sequence. This is just an overview so I don't want to burn anybody out because I'm going to be burnt out myself. But let's just look at a few places. There's 20 altogether, but, but um, if we move uh, this, you know, I wish you'd get ready and just move it for me, you know? Tell, tell me you did something for me. Um, see, they, there you go, the border with India, okay? You've got Alexandria. Um, and this is the... Uh, um, then you've got uh, another Alexandria here, so directly named after him. Um, Alexandria is here, Alexandria is here, Alexandria. Um, Alexandropolis here. Uh, we've obviously got um, um, two Alexanders here. We've got Ale Alexander here. Uh, we've also got um, an Alexandria down here um, and down here as well. So there's sort of been key positions around his world. 
Um, and this is really important um, to think about. So obviously these are new areas where he's find, founded 20 cities in his name. But there are cities that are named Alexandria in his memory. So this is where things get confusing. When we don't exactly have a, a textbook on this. Um, and it gets very, very awkward. Um, again, um, <laughs> again, here we go. It gets very confusing again. Um, uh, 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 Bucephalus, uh, Bucephala, named after his horse. Uh, all the Alexandrias here, you can see. So it's a map of Alexandrias. Um, and obviously, uh, this again is showing you the landscape of his estate. Um, and again, if you want to look at this one, it goes on. No. No, lots of them have been renamed. Um, I'm gonna have to. Um, I'm gonna have to do this um, by here. So, so if you go over onto, you're not really gonna see much. The one, the one in Greece there, um, Alexandropolis. Okay, so between Greece and Turkey. Um, and then you've got Alexandria Troas, Alexandria Troy, which is very near Troy, uh, which is um, here. Um, and then you've got the um, um, Isangderon, um, Alexandretta. Alexandretta here is the one that you see referred to in the Indiana Jones films, um, with the Ark of the Covenant and all the rest of it. Alexandria down here, and then you've got these swathe of other places named um, in his memory. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to cut off that and let's tell you a bit about Alexandria. Alexander, what's that? It's a nightmare, but that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, do you know, we, we, do you know what, we, we get stuff delivered to our house, right? Um, and it's not easy to get to where we live. And we have the postman delivering stuff that is clearly marked for houses that are in completely different towns Right, completely different addresses, and then just dumped at our place. Oh. We, had, we had a load of um, beauty magazines the other day, so I, I read a few. Tips, isn't it? Tips. I, got, I got some tips, yeah. So here we go. Alexander, who was known as Alexander the Third of Macedon, um, was born on the 20th of July at 5:15. Some say 5:16 in the year 356 BC. Uh, and he died on the 11th of June, 323 BC. So he was um, quite young when he died. Commonly known as Alexander the Great. Very few leaders in history have, be, have been known as Alexander, uh, have been known um, with the title of Great. Um, it's only bestowed upon a very few people. Um, he, he was a king of the ancient Greek um, kingdom. And he took on the mantle from his assassinated fa father, Philip II, which made him very angry. Um, he ascended the throne at the age of 20. He spent most of his ruling years on an unprecedented military campaign through Asia and North East Africa because he had visions to do so. And then eventually he had a final vision to return home um, that led to his untimely death. Um, he has, ha, has to be the only leader in history to be never defeated in battle. Um, you know, I, I've been looking at this. Um, even um, General Grant was defeated uh, by the Confederates in the American Civil War. And he would have been one of the more prominent um, generals in history who would have been uh, seen to be undefeated. But even he was um, defeated in battle. So was Napoleon defeated in battle. Um, he was undefeated in battle. So having a place named after you um, is quite an honour. Um, I'm, I'm going to chuck this in now. I don't know any places that were named after Napoleon, do you? If there are, I'm not really aware of them. Is it? Napoleon. <laughs> I'm moving on. Um, during his use, uh, youth, um, he was educated by um, no less than Aristotle. So, so we've got his learning and understanding of other cultures, which come very important in understanding those other cultures when you're bringing your sense of civilization to them and absorbing those other cultures as well. It's something that the Romans would use to good use many years later. Um, he inherited um, a strong kingdom and an experienced army. And he thought, right, let's just make this a bit bigger. 
um, by a hell of a lot bigger. Um, Alexander was awarded the generalship of Greece and used uh, this authority to launch his father's project to unite the Greek people and to conquer Persia. Um, in 334, he invaded the Persian Empire in a series of campaigns that lasted 10 years um, and then conquered, um, uh, he also conquered um, Turkey um, and, he, and he overthrew the reign of King Darius uh, III. Um, he endeavoured to reach the ends of the world and the great outer sea. So therefore invaded India in 326. Now it was only three years to go before he's, he's, he's dead. Uh, winning an important victory um, at the Battle of High Death Despas um, over the um, Indian uh, leaders. He eventually turned back at the demand of his homesick troops. Alexander died ironically in Babylon in the year 323 on the 11th of June. When I say ironically, it's that's the place he wanted to get to in the first place. Um, so after he bypassed it and done everything else, he ironically died there. He was welcomed into Babylon. Um, in the years following his death, a series of civil wars tore apart this wonderful empire. Um, um, and his, his generals and his heirs took over that empire. But one thing, one area that did survive um, to, um, to be a vassal of, of, of Greekness was to be amazing enough. Um, Egypt um, and we're going to hand around this coin now um, and this image itself is an image that's meant to portray um, Alexander the Great okay uh, and if I can just um, it's Ptolemy V and it dates to the year 205 BC um, so this is an image of Alexander the Great but it's Ptolemy V Ptolemy was one of um, Alexander the Great's fav famous um, favourite and most famous generals. Um, so the Ptolemaic generals and then leaders and kings took over Egypt. And therefore you've got Ptolemy I, Ptolemy II and Ptolemy V. And then um, you get um, Cleopatra, who's eventually um, defeated by um, Julius Caesar, to be part of that Ptolemaic world. Um, and this coin... Um, enshrines the Alexand Alexander's dream, um, and if you if you look at it, um, uh, extremely um, exceedingly valuable because it's fairly mint condition. Um, so no dropping it, please. You should actually be wearing gloves. Um, so Alexander's legacy not only were the cities, but the will the rich wealth of archaeology that he left behind. And, and the rich embodiment of the Greek world that he left behind, which um, not only in the names of cities, um, the archaeology uh, remains to echo through the ages of very fine built structures and the library um, and museum he established in Alexandria itself um, are to be seen his memorial, except both were destroyed. Uh, by subsequent cultures, but they remained intact uh, for a good 700 years. So that's not bad for libraries and museums that were dedicated not um, to um, Alexander's, uh, Alexander the Great's culture, but world culture indeed, uh, because texts of all cultures um, were cherished in this wonderful um, vassal of learning that has to be the Alexander the, the Great Library. Um, and you um, and sorry to have dismissed um, um, Wilson earlier on with King Arthur, but it's the story of King Arthur that actually be, be, uh, belongs to the story of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great's sword, <coughs> which is seen to have been made out of meteoric iron. And that went through the ages. Alexander the Great's sword was said to be um, to be bestowed to um, King Arthur, and that's the legend. That's as far as I'm going to go uh, with that. What age is that? Two o five. Two o five, and it's very heavy. And if you look at it, you can see um, you, you can see as 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 it forms into um, the mould. You can see as the, the metal's cooling 
as it retracts. Um, so that's pure iron around the edge. It, 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 it is a, it's a lovely piece. Um, I, I, I've got to tell you the story beyond that. My, um, uh, my, my, my dad went to Cyprus this one year and he, um, and he said, uh, he, he, he come back and he said, I went in an antique shop in Cyprus, it was about 1992. And he said, oh, I, I picked up this coin for, for, he must have picked it up for, for like the equivalent of a couple of quid. Um, and I cut two years ago, I said, I said, look, dad, I'm a bit short on money. Do you, do you mind me selling that coin you gave me as a present? And he said, it is yours. Uh, but I never sold it um, because, um, yeah, that 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 is something very precious. So what I want to do now is show you a list of the cities of Alexander the Great. Thank you, Julian. I don't know, I've got a slave in in, in my Monza class. You say, right, Brian, turn the lights off. Julian, go on, do the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, health and safety. Health and safety. Do you know? Do you know any excuse, Julian? Yeah. You know any excuse? Just no. So fat um, places. Um, there isn't exactly twenty here, but we know there's twenty cities. We haven't exactly identified all their locations yet. But um, and unfortunately, if I if I try and make this a bit wider. Um, Oh, no, we've gone the other way. This is, this is very weird, Brian. That this is recorded in Spain. Right, yeah, it is recorded, Cathy. So, um, so if we if we look if we look at this, uh, if we look at this chart, um, and this is where my my little pointing tool would come in useful. Uh, but let's just get an idea. Al um, Canome, Al Canome. Alexandria on the Oxus. Now you'll notice <laughs> an important thing, thank you very much, an important thing that lots of these locations are along rivers. So the association with the river um, is very important in the mindset of Alexander when he's establishing these cities. Naturally, when a city's being founded, he would have to leave some of his Greek entourage behind alongside a large number of his other entourage from different areas of the Greek world. So this is one of the cities in Afghanistan. Um, so that's number one. The next one is Alexandria Arankosia. Um, this is um, um, the place modern day name is Kandara. Um, it's otherwise known as Iskandara. Okay. Um, back to the film, The Man Who Would Be, be King, um, and, um, and that sort of mutation of his name. Um, again, um, this is, um, the next one is Alexandria Ariana um, in Afghanistan, modern day Herat. So some of these localities are actually underneath modern day cities. Alexandria Bukephalus in pa modern day Pakistan. Um, and this is on the river I'm not going to get the pronunciation right, the Helen River. The fifth one, Alexandria in Orietia, um, in modern day Balakostan in Pakistan. So you notice noticing these place names, Pakistan. Okay, so you've got a European ruler ruling in Pakistan. So, so this actually moving away from me saying it's not a massive empire, and you're now starting to see that in in the eyes of your thinking. Um, this is most of the educated world that's under the throw of, of Alexander the Great. Another one, Alexandra Kamania, um, unknown site in Iran. So uh, we, know the, we know the name, but we haven't exactly found it. Okay? There are Roman cities in Britain that haven't been found. So, you know, this is a bit further back in time. Um, Alexandria S. Uh, S. Chante um, in Tajikistan. Tajikistan is an old province of um, is an old is, is an old part of the Russian states. Tajikistan is its own country now, and that's way up there uh, above the Afghanistan border. And it's um, Eschante means the farthest of Alexandria's cities. And you can imagine when he's getting there, he's thinking, right, there's nothing else here, right? Can't see anything else. That's as far as we're going to go. Yeah. 
Um, so he did get to the, the farthest echelons. Alexandria on the um, Caucasus, um, Afghanistan, Alexandria on the Indus River, Pakistan. Okay. Um, you go a bit closer to home. And some cities were named after Alexandria closer to home. Um, um, Alinda, which we also uh, look at today, um, is um, Alexandria on the Latmos River in Turkey. Um, it would help if I had a plan there, but but you know where the next one is, Alexandria Troas. That's where in the location, the Troas, in the location of modern day Troy, uh, Cabrene. Um, so we know that location. Another one, Alexandria on a Piana uh, River um, at um, Ganznia. Uh, we've missed it. one in Iraq. Um, Chares, Spasny, Alexandria in Susinia Suz in Iraq. Some of the modern names in the mixture. Iskandaria. Uh, modern day Iraq, um, Iskandurum, again in Turkey, um, there's another one in Turkmenistan, um, another uh, ex-Russian state place called Merv, known as Alexandria, Maginia. So you've, you've got uh, all these localities um, and ov obviously we've got Alexandretta, uh, which is basically on the border between modern Turkey, um, which is... The one that they mentioned in the Indiana Jones films. Um, I mentioned all these different films. Lots of research goes into these films. And you can pick up nice little facts here and there. Even though they're fantasy films, you can. They're really useful. <coughs> a Man Who Would Be King is a, a wonderful one there. Lots, lots of really good facts in there by uh, Rudyard Kipling. Um, anyway, back, back to this. We're going to go next to um, the city of all cities, Alexandria itself. Um, over the over the course of his conquest, Alexandria, naturally founding the 20 cities that bore his name, Alexandria in Egypt um, would be become one of the leading Mediterranean cities. Um, it, it was the city of the Mediterranean. It was the port into Africa. It was the port into Asia. Uh, it was a port out of Africa. It, it, it was the place to be. Alexandria was the educational hub of the world. It was in the middle of the world. That's the place. Um, that was where everything axled out of. Every, every, every civilization after that would want to conquer um, Alexandria in Egypt. Um, the Christians, the Muslims. Um, you've then got all the way through to Napoleon. You know, Napoleon conquering Alexandria, then Cairo, and then Egypt felt that the, this was now the hub and home of his new um, um, Napoleonic world. It wouldn't last very long, but this is the place to be because it's a place of education. He, Ale, Napoleon knew it um, in 1797. Um, so the city's locations reflected trade routes as well as defensive positions on the border and along the rivers as well. You, you control the river, you control trade. Um, at first, the cities must have been inhospitable in areas of absolute wastelands on the edge of nowhere, but they became those hubs of the Greek world. And those hubs that the generals after the death of Alexander the Great would want to grab and possess and make their own. Um, following Alexander the death, many Greeks who had settled um, at these localities tried to re return home. Those that didn't remain there in Greek civilization continued. Um, however, a century or so after Alexander the Great, many of the Ale Alexandrians were thriving with elaborate public buildings of substantial populations that included both Greek and local people. So an area of cosmopolitan joy in the eyes of the modern thinking. Um, so what we're going to do now, we mentioned a tiny bit of, about um, Alexandria. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this locality. If I can just stop this thing faffing about. Uh, this is a lost city uh, that was founded by Alexander the Great, um, discovered by archaeologists in Iraq, found with the help of a drone. Hopefully this will work. Um, so... We're naturally still trying to find some of his cities, and um, I think I'm doing a pretty good job today, but um, 
when, when you're presenting something like this for the first time, um, um, there's always that flow to try and keep going. Um, so I'm just going to go with this one. I set this all up. Lost City um, found in Iraq, uh, founded by Alexander the Great, found, discovered by archaeologists. It's amazing. And this is in, uh, this is last year, 2017. Probably you didn't come across this in the news. Um, and um, it's saying, archaeologists in Iraq have discovered a city which was lost for more than 2,000 years with the help of a drone. Um, um, it's the it's um, now it's become made public. Um, we'll call it the Darband, um, and it was founded by Alexander the Great, Alexandria or whatever it was called, which is believed to have been founded in 331 BC by Alexander the Great. It was discovered by a team of Iraqi and British archaeologists led by experts from the British Museum. So for once, we're talking about Iraq, something useful going on instead of blowing these things up, um, and. You know, 99% of the time, uh, you know, the military is absolutely disastrous for archaeology. But 1% of the time, um, <laughs> military and the uses of military can be absolutely um, flowering with what we can learn. For example, um, the aerial photography that Luftwaffe took over Britain uh, just before the war, <coughs> we use that as gems to, to find archaeological sites even today. Okay, so that we do find uses and uses um, of these drones in Iraq help us to find new cities. Um, Greek coins found at this site um, and statues of Greek Roman deities have also been found at the site in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, staff from the British Museum have been training Iraqi heritage experts in government funded schemes designed to help archaeologists protect sites of historical significance in areas of the Middle East which have been severely impacted by conflict. The Emergency Heritage Management Training Program have trained workers in advanced techniques including global positioning systems, satellite imagery and geophysics. So this helps new sites to be discovered accurately and hopefully protected. Um, and we've had absolute chaos in Iraq for the past um, um, 16 years um, since the um, illegal invasion in 2003. But now hopefully we can turn this around uh, after ISIS. We've got a lot of damage to um, improve upon, but naturally the archaeology that we're coming across um, is, is, is really, really important. Um, so this is, um, this is another site um, known as Alinda. Um, and Alinda is one of those sites um, that um, I'm going to try and show you where it is. In the most Latimer's Canyon people, so we've got Right, I think um, Alinda. Yeah, Alinda, I think that's the one in, in Turkey. Um, Alinda, um, this is what Alinda looks like today. Absolutely beautiful ruins. Um, and lots of these cities, after the, the point is, after the, lots of these cities, after they were founded by Alexander the Great, um, seem to continue. Um, and this, this site um, of Alinda, um, was a small sort of subsidy, but it was captured by Alexander the Great in 334 BC. Um, and it's talking about, um, as a result, Macedonians took over the city. Uh, it's sort of um, in the ilk Alexander the Great. It's sort of named in his memory. And we've got some beautiful archaeology in the background. Uh, more of it there. So, you know, lots of these cities did, did survive and continue. I think some of this stuff is absolutely beautiful. Um, unfortunately, I made the decision that um, um, if I went through every single site, we'd, we're just going to really get trouble. Um, we're just going to have loads of images uh, that don't mean as much sense as they should do. Back to the text about Alexandria itself. So we've moved off there to a couple of examples of Alexander the Great Cities. Um, and Alexander is believed um, to have founded this wonderful um, new city on the isthmus of the river Nile. Um, it had been a little village at the time. Um, you can imagine a tiny little village, and in a few years, it's a massive city. So um, the archaeologists excavated there. They were told that, you know, this is a city that is, that's been founded only by Alexander the Great. There was nothing here before, but, um, yeah, it's not exactly true. There was a tiny little village there before, you know. What we always do see in history is the reason why somebody goes 
and build something there is because it's, there's a house there already or there's a village there and they just say right we scrape it all away we founded something here that's what's going on with alexander alexandria and alexander the great city there that, that wonderful city um pointing out and heading looking at the mediterranean and even today we're, we're learning so much about alexandria with 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 the wonderful watery archaeology there um you know sunken bits of um this wonderful city of alexander the great we've got the wonderful um pharos this wonderful lighthouse that's constructed at alexandria and we've now started to find bits of it uh, this was to be um um, in the later list of the seven ancient wonders um, of the world, because naturally um, Herodotus's um, ancient wonders of the world back in 400 odd BC, he had a list of seven, and obviously this wonderful Pharos at Alexandria is built years after the original list of seven. So this eventually goes into the new list of seven, and then the Romans have a new list of seven. But the lighthouse itself seems to always be in the list of seven, and it, and it survives for about um, 1,500 years until an earthquake and the whole thing disappeared into the sea. Uh, but again, I, I, he's got a lighthouse, the Pharos of Alexandria, built um, to shrine what he believed, uh, in, also in safety in his people, um, and that's what this, this is, we know from the archaeology that the lighthouse did exist. It's not just a fable. It's not just in the list. Um, so Alexander Intellectual and Cultural Centre. Um, and we're really starting to find hidden in those depths now, out along the coast of Alexander, we're starting to find um, um, carved, um, carved um, hieroglyphic tablets with hieroglyphs of Greek. We're starting to find statuary of Greek and Egyptian gods alongside each other, temples dedicated to the two. Um, Alexander the Great was a true god uh, in his um, memory on this planet. So few people have so much named in their memory, and they're still named in his memory today. Not just to be seen in the archaeology as fables. It's a city uh, that attracted not just Greeks, but... Um, Egyptians, Jews, Syrians, Phoenicians, everywhere. And naturally, with all that wealth of history, it became the target of plundering in the late 400s, the 500s, and 600s, uh, with the uh, diaspora of collapse with civilization in that neck of the world. But if it had survived, and that library and museum had survived, we would never have to find an ancient document again because it would have all been there. We would be so educated in all the ways of the world if it had still been there. It was blamed on Islam um, because um, when the um, Islamic hordes got to Egypt, um, they burnt down a building that had nothing in it because we were told that the Greeks had um, took, taken the documents out and just burnt the lot um the christians are taking the documents out and burnt the lot um so what we've got um we've got so much being rediscovered so looking again at this um alexandria alexandria itself um was always to be seen the target um of of, of people wanting to learn about civilization but also the target of destroying civilization as well there were many uprisings there but throughout all these uprisings the library and the museum survived should we do the pharos of alexandria let's just do it so go for it uh, we've got a nice image which i'm sure you've all seen um so here we go uh, there you go the pharos of alexandria i'm not cursing you as much now kathy because it seems to be working um, right. Oh. <laughs> we don't care about you. Um, Pharos of Alexandria, um, obviously in the list of seven wonders of the world, and it's archaeology that's actually been seeing uh, the real truth of this building. Um, in antiquity, it was a technological triumph um, in the archetype of all lighthouses since. 
Um, so we've got this huge tower with a huge bellowing flame on, on the roof, um, which would, would, would give light to the landscape. Some say mirrors were involved, some say glass was involved, but a light standing on a plane of echo nothingness would shine out forever. Um, built um, by um, Sotras of Crindus, perhaps for Ptolemy I. Now, Ptolemy I is this general, the, the favourite and great love of Alexander. Um, it was finished during the reign of Sotas, um, uh, son, Ptolemy's son, in uh, Egypt in the year 280. So by 280, 50 years after the death of Alexander the Great, this great lighthouse again would echo to the majesty that everything um, um, that was enshrined in the idea of Alexander going out conquering the world. The lighthouse stood on the island of Pharos in the harbour of Alexandria. And can I, um, can I just tell you a little bit of a story, right? And none of you would have had my uh, first book on the Romans uh, in the Vale of Morgan, and they're very sought after and expensive things to come by nowadays. But um, when originally in my first book, I, I was writing about the, the Pharos and Barry, um, and it was said that we may have had a Roman Pharos and Barry off the Port Kerry coast. Um, but unknown to me, the printer had done a spell check. Um, and couldn't work out what the word pharos mean, meant. Uh, couldn't work out what it meant, so we actually changed the word to pharaoh. <laughs> and I didn't know until somebody phoned me up and he said, um, I didn't know there was a lost pharaoh in Barry off the coast. <laughs> and I tell you what, yeah, in, in, uh, one person spotted it, but I'm sure everybody else did as well. Um, so, so you've got the Pharos, and it uh, is said to have been 110 metres high. Now, it's said to have been 110 metres high. We might be able to prove it now by the dimensions of the stones uh, that we do find in the harbour there. You know, there might be a way of, uh, uh, Cathy knows this, there might be a way of seeing a stone, um, working the amount of weight that was on it, giving you an idea of height. Mm. And we get that from the brocks that we see um, places like Orkney and Shetland. Now, I, I've been to the Brock at Moster and I've shown you, it's about 12, um, 12 metres in height. It's a huge tower, 12 metres, 12, 12. Huge tower. This is meant to be 110 metres in height. The, the amount of stress that that must have placed on the stones below would have been incredible. Uh, you're talking about really, uh, we're talking about Granite would have need, needed to have been used to deal with those stresses. No other stone could have dealt with that stress. Limestone, sandstone could not have dealt with that stress. You'd have carried it and they'd just gone to dust. You'd have had to have used something low there like granite. And we're seeing the qualities of the materials that you used in the Pharos. Some of these materials were taken elsewhere to be used in the later rebuilding of Alexandria throughout the years. But we do find examples of it now in the harbour, in Stroy examples as well. Uh, the um, this would, this would have equaled among the heights of the Pyramid of Giza. Slightly smaller, but the Pharos itself at that time, forget about the Pyramids of Giza, being built at that time, um, in contemporary memory, would have been the tallest structure made on this planet. Okay, forget the Pharaohs, tallest structure ever made on the planet for a, a large number of years. Um, much of what is known about the structure of the lighthouse comes from a work in 1909 um, from Hermann um, um, Therisch. Um, and he, oh, well, obviously, he couldn't have written much because it's disappeared. He wrote about this work and he did lots of research. According to the ancient sources consulted by um, Therisch, uh, the lighthouse was built in three stages, all sloping slightly inwards. Uh, the lowest um, was square, the next octagonal, and the top cylindrical. A broad spiral ramp led to the top where a fire burned at night. It's interesting we're talking about, um, you know, uh, we, we're talking about something being square and then octagonal and cylindrical. That's a very unique way of building. Um, but that's what we're talking about. So he's referring to documents, and sadly, most of these documents haven't survived those years since 1909. Remember, um, I think um, 
if I'm right in saying Herman um, Therisk was German, um, not sure on that, but we've got two huge wars in the meantime, um, and lots of things have been lost, unfortunately. Um, so there you go. We've got to have it square. Um, and there's the lighthouse. Some say it was surrounded by an island, but there we have it. Maybe another Pharos on the opposite side, but we've got to focus on this Pharos itself, Pharos Island. Um, and somewhere around here, um, <coughs> there's believed to be the um, tomb of Alexander the Great. Um, but that is a story for the end today, not next week. But we've got this wonderful Pharos, and as you imagine, the, the wonderful discoveries made in this harbour stretch way out into the bay. Um, and it's almost as if people dive down there and you see statues under the water saying hello and welcome to my temple under the sea. Um, and this is what we see, no fantasy or, um, or chalked up image. It's something that's absolutely real. There's so much there. Um, and the building blocks of this lighthouse are being found today. Um, it's, it's in the ilk of the um, Colossus of Rhodes. Um, whenever I've done the Ancient Wonders, you always see that little bits of these antique ramblings are found. And it's believed that in the harbour of Rhodes, bits um, of the Colossus have also been found. But that's debatable. What isn't debatable is what we do find associated with this wonderful <coughs> lighthouse. A bit more. Some descriptions report that the lighthouse was surmounted by a huge statue, possibly rep representing either Alexander the Great or Ptolemy. Let's just go with Alexander. <laughs> if, if the Ptolemaic coins have an image of Alexander the Great on, then I think the statue would have been in the family as well. Because Ptolemy had the best of Alexander's world. He would not have wanted to reign over Greek, um, the Greek landscape, for example, because he probably had his throat slit. So um, the, the Egyptian world was the best of Alexander's um, domains after his death. Um, in the form, <coughs> some say, um, of the sun god Kilos. Um, though it was well known earlier, the Pharos does not appear in any list of wonders until, um, that can't, that's not right. Oh, right, yeah, it is. I thought that said B, B, C, then, right. Yeah, um, we, we don't see, we see, obviously, as I mentioned, it's in, in later lists. Um, in the Middle Ages, um, a certain um, Sultan uh, uh, Ahmed uh, replaced the beacon with a small mosque. Um, the Pharos was still standing in the um, 11 1200s, but by 1477, the Mamluk Sultan was able to build a fort from its ruins close by. Um, did anything survive? Yes, it's, it's in the bay. There'll be five <laughs> bits of it in the bay. Uh, we, we didn't see much else about the statue there. Um, so, here we go. This is more, more about this um, wonderful pharos and a little bit about the discovery stuff. Um, what time are we? Um, do I take a break? Yeah, not yet. Uh, in 1994, archaeologist um, Jean um, Empereur, founded founder of the Centre for Alexandrian Studies, uh, made an exciting find in the waters of the Pharos Island. He had been called in by the Egyptian government to map anything of archaeological significance in this underwater area before a concrete um, breakwater was erected over the site. He mapped the location of hundreds of huge masonry blocks. So did, did um, the Sultan use everything from the Pharos? Um, or was the Pharos already in the sea at that point? Um, at least some of these blocks are believed to have fallen into the sea when the lighthouse was destroyed by an earthquake in the 1300s. A large amount of statuary <coughs> was also discovered, including a colossal statue of a king dating um, to the 200s BC that was thought to represent Ptolemy II. Mm. 
remember this is a coin of Ptolemy V. Comparison, a companion statue um, of a queen um, as Isis um, had been discovered nearby in the 1960s. These statues represent um, the, the deification of the Ptolemies, or Ptolemy II and his wife, um, Arsins, are thought to have been placed just under the lighthouse, facing the entrance to the harbour. So here I am, coming into my wonderful Alexand Alexander's um, city, um, and here I am, um, the son of Ptolemy, the great general of Alexander the Great. Based upon these finds, the Egyptian government abandoned the idea of a breakwater and planned instead an underwater park where divers could view the many statues, stone sphinxes, and remains of the lighthouse. And to be honest with you, is that a nice ending? <laughs> it's a lovely ending. Yeah, for a change, for a change yes. For a change, it is. For a change. So I think what we'll do, uh, we'll take a break. Now, um, if we, I will go at speed. Um, so um, Alexandra Ascante uh, is one site that we will be visiting. And we'll be coming back to Ale Alexandria at the end. And I, I think we've got Bucephala as well. Um, you know, Alexandria Bucephala, named after his horse, um, in, in memory of, of the loss of his wonderful horse. Um, I might be wrong, or completely barking, but I think that's uh, where Bukefala died, because we established a city in Bukefala's memory, or it was done afterwards, something like that. But Bukefala died somewhere over there. Um, um, and that's that. So, um, are there any um, questions? Did he have a consistent plan for the city to be uh, uh, founded? You know what? You know, whenever I, I think of Alexander the Great, I actually feel in myself a great deal of frustration. I, I, I feel that he didn't he, he didn't know what he wanted. I, I, I feel that he was he was lost in what he wanted to do. I feel that um, the visions that he had um, were pushing him too far, um, and he wanted to he needed a vision to say go home. Um, <laughs> he was trying to do more than his, his father had done. He, he, I don't think may, maybe he wanted to become greater than Philip II. Um, but he achieved greatness over Philip II when he defeated the Persians. His father was a great general, masterful in battle, but he'd done much more than his father. So I didn't, I don't know whether he wanted to be beyond his father because he'd already done it. Um, did he have a vision? Did he have a plan? Um, I don't think he did. Just driven, basically. Driven. But but he was not to be immortalized like Adolf Hitler or Napoleon. Um, he was driven by something that um, Napoleon and Adolf Hitler didn't have. Um, and he did love his men. He did love what he was trying to do. He wanted to create something, but he wasn't sure in that vision. And if he may have lived another 10 years, he could have sat back and said, right, that's what I've done. But he didn't, we don't, didn't live long enough. Like many famous people, they don't live long enough to tell us what they really wanted. On that note, that's a good place to stop. Um, we've got lots to lots to do in the break, so um, let's uh, let's get on. So where we are next, um, where we are um, next is um, looking at this wonderful um, where where we've got the cities. So obviously uh, his route, wherever he's going, he's establishing cities. Um, we're run around by here, so we've gone all the way through Babylon and all the way uh, up here, all the way through, establishing all these cities, um, and and obviously going to the border. There's no, there's no real sense. Back to what you said, I, I find Alexander the Great really difficult to um, to connect with. Um, like, you know, I can connect with lots of different historical figures and understand where they're at, but Alexander the Great's a weird weird one. Um, and we're only talking about 12 years. That's mm. That 12 years, if you take that away, Alexander the Great, nobody did know about him. Um, that's, that's all it was. But the impact on history was phenomenal. Um, all military leaders um, wished that they could be Alexander the Great. Um, Napoleon is no exception to that. Um, and the likes of Adolf Hitler admired Alexander the Great. And so many other leaders, military leaders and other leaders in history, have admired Alexander the Great. 
Um, but you've got to ask, to what cost um, in history did this, this have? Um, and I really don't know the answer to that question either. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do now is look, oh, bugger, where have we gone? Uh, we're going to look at uh, this little place here, Alexandria um, es uh, Chante, Escante, um, and again, this is way on the borders of the known world. This is beyond any army I should have gone. Um, when we look in the 1800s, there was two huge military expeditions of the British Army into to Afghanistan, and both completely failed. And didn't one military ex uh, um, expedition keep? Because you're the military guy. Nobody actually ever returned. One man. One man. Yeah, that's right. One man returned from this military um, expedition, and this is, um, yeah, going going up that way. And and there was the. That, that one individual gave uh, the embodiment for the story of Rudyard Kipling's um, uh, Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling book, which uh, which is actually the name has actually gone on my head a minute. I'm a blonde. Man who would be king. Every uh, a man who would be king. Yeah. Sorry, the blonde moment then. Um, so there you go. Moving on. Right. So um, it's it's going to be the northly. <laughs> Just think of a, a, a Alexandria. Estante, listen to this, it is the northerly bit of the Greek Empire. And it's in Afghanistan. Try and get your mind around that. It's not easy. Um, it's established on the south bank of the river um, Jakarate. Um, and it's close to the modern town of Kudjand. Um, according to the Roman writer Cursus, um, Alexandria... Um, at Shante retained its Hellenistic culture, its Greek culture, um, going up to the birth of Christ as well. So it's a, it's a, um, a Greek civilization that, that's um, still got links with Greece 300 years after it's founded, which, which is um, astonishing, considering the lengths you'd have to go to to get there in the first place. Well, I don't, I don't really understand how they could do that, because... If the army is moving up, how many of their own people did they leave behind? Then did other people come out from Greece? Were they teaching the locals to build, to um, build things? I, I, I don't see how they could have done that with the numbers. I, I think I think the answer is that some did leave, stay behind, and some did stay behind to keep the culture going, and some stayed behind to actually create the structures in the first place. But how many are we talking about? I think the answer, I think the real answer is, Kathy, this. The real answer is. When you look at the Roman world in Britain, right? Oh, I, I nearly got in. Uh, when you look at the Roman world in Britain, um, I can always say this, knowing that you've all got a copy of the books. This but isn't a sales piece, but... Behind, but... each one of these cities, yeah. how many people have got left at the end of it? Yeah, but the point is, the point is in, a, in a book like this, it says Ro Romans in the Vale of Gamorgan. Now, if you think the amount of Romans that were in the Vale of Gamorgan, um, you could probably fit them in this room. And those were the um, those those were the cultural elements giving Romanization to everybody in this area. We're only talking about handfuls of people, and handfuls of influence give that sense of civilization. Yeah. So if we think of the the Vikings in Ireland, the Vikings in Dublin, right? There weren't millions of them. There there were mere a few hundred here and there. But oh, they're so still they're Viking they're Dublin. Huh? Greek temples and carving and all this sort of stuff. It's a bit. Different. I, I know your your frustration is my frustration. The answer is they they Alexander the Great had the power to be able to broadcast his sense of Greek civilization, and he must have done it um, by utilizing some of his individuals at per location. Or you could look at it another way: they're building a city leaving a small number of people behind and just moving off. But that would mean that would mean the other thing. That would assume that his soldiers were prepared to build cities. And I don't think they were. Well, no. I mean, they they wouldn't have been prepared. So they'd have to teach the locals how yes. to stick a gigantic column up and how to cast canthus leaves and how to do a new statue yeah. of what, Alexander or whatever. Yes. And, you know, I think that's just going to take two minutes, doesn't it? 
Pardon? No, no, but, but basically the whole point is, Jane, Jane's asked an interesting question. Sorry, got Chris, what, go. Right, so, so basically, no, this isn't over 12 years. This is over a few weeks. So he's, he's in this locality and he's moving on. So there, there, there must have been... And the other thing as well is this is really difficult to grasp and you, you, you've just opened a huge hole in its nest which there's no answers to for once. Um, and the other thing as well is if they're leaving a civilization influence behind, who the hell's protecting these individuals? But these cities are surviving for hundreds of years. So there, there's some power that they've got over the local people. And this, this power is not the power that the conquistadors had over the people in Central America. They would go to Central America, they would rape, pillage, kill, spread disease, millions of people were wiped out, everybody hated the conquistadors, but because there's nobody else around, the conquistadors can sort of establish an area and don't feel threatened, right? And they've got a gun. These people didn't have guns, and they, they weren't wiping areas out using diseases. They, they were a civilizing influence. And the biggest problem is you've answered the question that I cannot answer in any form. Every single week I get answered questions and I could give an answer to it, but today I can't. Um, Alex, pardon? That, that's the only answer. Well, he must have, he must have left at, well, at least one who said, right, I'll be the ruler of this city. And I'll but one's not enough to control the people. Him as, um, a god. Deity, yeah. yeah, that may have been it. If you again go to Rajad Kipling's book, The Man Who Would Be King, and there was this is the sense there's there's two British soldiers. I know this is a fantasy book, but there's two British soldiers going to Afghanistan, and the whole film is that these two individuals rule over thousands of people because they've got guns and they're seen as white people who who look like gods. And the pre the prefix of the film is is that Alexander the Great was a god. And the reason why it unfolded at the end of the film was because, um, was it, uh, Mike, Mike, uh, Michael Caine was bitten by the lo a local woman um, who he married called um, Roxana Kowak, who, who bit him, and then they found out that he was bleeding and he's no longer a god. So he's tried to kill them, right? They crucified one of them and they tried to kill them. The whole point might be that Rudyard Kipling was saying that this influence, the civilizing influence, was actually over the fact that whoever was left behind was thought as a, as a, as of as a god. Um, also, I, I'm sure you know, you know, you went to Babylon and all those places. They had skilled people there who carved yes. and you know did the yeah, you know, in, in, you know they they weren't sort of totally. Yeah, and and, and I, I, I think that the other point is, is that's a really Im other important point that we can learn from Roman Britain. When a, uh, this is not actually the same, but when, when a Roman's actually come over to Britain, they know everything that's here and they know people have got certain skills and agriculture and all the rest of it and they use it. Alexander the Great goes to these places and does he know anything or does he already know something? There might be something in what I've already said that there's already people going out saying, look, you know, um, we're Greek civilization. Um, let's start building something. By the time Alexander the Great comes here, look at what we can do. And everybody says, oh, wow, we want to be part of this. That might be it. Because similar ilk to what the Romans did. By the time the Romans got over to Britain after 43 AD, most of the South Coast was um, relatively aware and Romanized already. So the Romans just come in and said, look at us. And they said, oh, well, we're, we're already doing the Roman thing. Most people ain't over there. And, we, and it's just that build up. Really difficult question there, Cathy. Um, as with most other cities founded by Alexander the Group, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, it's said that a small group of retired or wounded veterans would remain behind. But that's not enough for us in this room. That's just not enough to build cities. That's not enough. It, it, it's not enough. And I agree with you. Um, Alexandra Escant um, Escanti was surrounded by um, a large number of tribes. Um, and Greek people settled in other localities. Um, there's a place known as Alexandria on the Oxus, um, a, which had a wall around the city in Alexander's name, according to ancient authors, um, that was completed in 20 days. Um, a three, um, a 3.7, hang on, listen to this, a 3.7 mile wall built around the city was completed in 20 days. 
Um, now, I don't want you to believe that, but I want to give an analogy. When we were building the railway lines in this local area, we had a, we had, used to have navvies from Ireland, right? Small gangs of navvies who would be able to build bridges and stuff within within two or three weeks. Whole, huge, wonderful architectural bridges within two or three weeks because they were so skilled and they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that stone went there. They knew the right mix. And these bridges are standing today, right? Um, if you've got trained people to do this, but you need a lot of trained people to do this. And then we're back to that problem. What the hell's going on? Um... It said that there would have been conflicts between local people, but how the hell did these cities remain intact within the sense of Romanization for such a long time? Um, it's also said that um, it's also said that the Chinese were well aware of Alexander the Great. Well, the Chinese writers. Program about China. They said that Greek sculpture was introduced at a particular time. Yeah. In China, yeah. yeah. So, so we've got all this coming in. Um, Alexandra Chante, um, it's to be seen, was almost within within a huge mix match of peoples. There were loads of different peoples: Indo-European people, Chinese people. Uh, you, you, you're coming in uh, Afghani people, all different faiths and all the rest of it. Chinese links. It's almost as if a border between two worlds, and it may have been one of those one of those levelers. Um, but we've got the sense, and, and, and here's something interesting. I think Kathy mentioned then. And in any case, um, a city known, um, which was mentioned by scholars of the Han Dynasty a um, hundred years before Christ, was almost certainly Alexandria Achante. Um, so the Chinese were well aware of it. And the prefix um, great um, was given the suffix to the person who built it. Um, and it said here that the Chinese had renditions of building in the Ionic style about 100 years later with the Ionic um, um, columns. So Doric is very square, um, very square type of uh, columns. Ionic is like um, scrolls. And, and Corinthian um, is with the canthus canth leaves. Um, but they're bringing these styles in with them. See, so you, you're right, you've been reading my notes again. Chinese, um, and it's said that, that the Chinese um, would have ambassadors go into places um, like Alexandria Scante, ambassadors go in there um, to look at a contribution towards trade in. Silk. So you've got silk going in there. So so silk's an important link here as well. Um, so with with all that being said, um, we not only find um, we not only find these cities, but we also find uh, military bases as well. Um, and it's this great romance that's associated with Alexander the Great. And it's very short um, length of time that it was within our midst. The remains of Alexandra's town in an archaeological sense um, is to be seen um, in the later aspirations of walls and archaeological remains from the 900s. That's what can be seen. But these overlay this wonderful fortified location established by Alexander the Great. Um, Maybe the very act of Alexander the Great <clears throat> being there, putting the first foundation stone, was enough to have this city um, in the ilk of Alexander the Great civilization. Um, and when they've excavated the site, um, they found um, utensils, um, military equipment dating back to the time. And your mind starts to glaze over. You're thinking there's Greek military equipment from the time of Alexander the Great at this city in Afghanistan. It just you glaze over, um, and it said that um, it said um, in the Latin with um, a Latin writer writing about this wonderful city, hic Alexandra responsum accept um, usque queo Alexander, which basically means here Alexander accepted answer until where Alexander, and it's at this point um, that Alexander had the answer to return home to the furthest lengths of the borders of a possible um, new empire 
Um, Alexander uh, was seen to have been visited by celestial creatures that told him to return back to Greece. And he never, ever did. Um, so what I want us to do um, is in the heart of Alexander's world, as he's coming back, he's obviously founding other cities. Uh, a great one is known as Merv. Uh, and with each city he's establishing, um, he's seen to be in the conquest and the attributor to a new civilization within the vast um, realms of the wastes that he's conquering. Um, many people have seen to wish to find um, the sites of Alexander the Great, um, and many Greek, uh, no, many German archaeologists have gone out across Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan to find these great cities. Um, the Germans were very much interested in Greek culture. Um, they were very much interested in Greek culture and their own foundations, um, even in the 1880s, 1890s. This, we're talking about the Germans now. So anything about the pure race and the Anna Nerve was building um, for 50 years before we ever get to Heinrich Himmler. This is a German obsession. They're obsessed with the Greek world. And they're obsessed with anything that's to do with Alexander the Great. And they're also the great finders of many of Alexander the Great's sites. Um, and it's down to um, um, German... Um, ingenuity and sense of reading the tracks to be able to find their sites in the first place. Um, the one site I just want to mention briefly um, is um, Bucephalus um, and um, and years um, Alexandria Bucephalus on, on, a, on a medieval manuscript. Um, Alexandria Bucephalus. There it is. Um, on these lesser banks um, and from my text if I may oh there we go Alexandra Bucephalus um, there it is um, and I think this gives a bit of perspect really Bucephalus there Alexandria Escante you, you can really see um, that this is more than a territory that would be a barrier for Alexander, but it never was. And I, and I think that's down to his ingenuity over later expeditions <coughs> of not just the British, but the Russians and later civilizations that wished to conquer such a barren, endless landscape like, like Afghanistan, surrounded and enshrined by mountains. But it's to be said that Alexander the Great managed to conquer these mountains. It's like Canute, King Canute, um, uh, um, and uh, no, it's not King Canute uh, conquering the seas. Who, who, who was it again? Yeah, it is King Canute. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, stop the sea, right? Didn't stop the sea, right? Alexander the Great conquered these great landscapes, and I think that's uh, to be seen to immortalise him, because here we are over these huge mountain ranges, over the Hindu Kush, well beyond into India. We've got this great city that's being constructed in the memory of his horse. And that tells you a great deal about Alexander the Great. Um, a little bit further about Alexander the Great, he was a very a exceedingly insecure individual. Um, he found relationships to be very difficult. He found it very difficult to be close to people. Uh, the love that he had was um, for people who exerted themselves to great um, ends um, in battle. Um, and he lived to fight. And that's all he ever knew. And he loved his horse. Alexandra Bucephalus was a city founded by Alexander the Great in the memory of his beloved horse, Bucephalus. Founded in May 363 BC, the town was located at the um, high defies um, of the Helm River, um, east of the Indus River, so we passed the Indus River. Bucephalus had died after the battle of Hydespes. Um, Hydespes was a battle that was close. Um, he nearly lost that battle. 
Um, and if he had, um, history would never be the way that it is today. Greek civilization would have collapsed um, and all the cities would have collapsed. Um, and I don't know what would have happened. He, he was he was um, fighting the Indian princes who were armed on the backs of elephants. He would have come across elephants before now, but this was something very, very different. Alexandra Bucephalus remained a significant centre for some time, well beyond the bounds of the Greek world, beyond the bounds. This is not even in the Western world. This isn't even in the Eastern world. This is in the, the far distant lands. Um... Uh, and uh, it's said um, by a um, by a writer in um, the period after the birth of Christ, a Roman writer. Um, the country and land of Baragaza is inhabited by numerous tribes such as the Arate, the Arascosi, the um, Gandari, and the people of Poclas, in which Bucephalus Alexandra is to be found. Um, we know there are about 20 cities and, and we see, um, it's said the 17 cities named Alexandra, but we see that he founded 20 cities um, and he renamed altogether 70, according to Pliny, writing um, just before the eruption of Vesuvius on the 20th of August, AD 79. Um, and it's, um, lots of things have been written about this city, but I really want to get on um, um, and it just basically just a few things. Um, it's it, there are lots of these things are associated with the Silk Route, Alexander's army crossing great rivers, going into the Orient. Um, and and we've got various um, various information um, historically um, about the battles, um, the unexcavated ruins, and all the rest of it. But this is a great city that lasted in the ilk. Of Alexander the Great for quite some time. Uh, there you go. Uh, we've now got to go on to the death of Alexander the Great himself. And this is where we'll call it an end after um, looking into the mystery of where he's buried. We've got to go to Babylon. Um, it's um, it's uh, 323 BC. Um, the death of Alexander the Great um, after the pa painting by Carl von Piloy um, in 18. 86. And there's Alexander the Great. Um, and there's his generals coming in. What shall we do next, sire? Um, and apparently, um, I don't know how that works, but there's about 150 odd horses there pulling um, his shrine um, across the wastes of um, Mesopotamia. Uh, I don't know how that works. Um, um, Babylon is um, south, 20 kilometers south of Baghdad. Um, Babylon extensively excavated, um, obviously by German British archaeologists. So it's, um, I think it's either 20 kilometers, <coughs> 20 miles south of Baghdad. Um, there he is, engraving by. Um, and this is going on to Alexander, Alexander's tomb. Everybody wished to, to see Alexander the tomb, Alexander the Great's tomb. Even Julius Caesar the, visited Alexander the Great, Great tomb. When Octavian took over as the first emperor of the Roman world on the 28th, uh, 28 BC, um, Octavian is said to have visited the tomb of Alexander the Great as well. Nero is said to have visited the tomb of Alexander the Great and obtained the great sword of Alexander the Great, so that Nero could reign over the whole world. But we know that um, Nero was definitely more pieces short of a loaf. Uh, this is a plan uh, made, I think, in the late 1800s. Um, and if I'm right in thinking, um, it's showing the location of Alexander the Great's tomb. Some people believe it's been found, but let's go on to my notes. Some people it was thought it was a glass sarcophagi um, that he was buried in, and you could look in and, and see his wonderful body um, decaying, surrounded by his artefacts. But this might not be too far away from the truth. I, I went to Zakynthos, the island of Zakynthos, 
um, <coughs> when I was um, very young. It was 1985, or 1985, I went to the kids' class with my parents, I was 10 years old, um, and we went into a church, and there was this glass case um, with a monk in, inside rotting, and in a big glass case. And I was looking inside this thinking, yeah, wow, this is a bit strange, isn't it? But when you think of that, and you take it back a few years, Alexander the Great being in a glass case, it's not too far out. Um, they, they may have had the technology to have um, individual pieces of glass sheeting around it, but that's another thing altogether. Um, there it is, a more advanced plan. Um, the, 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 actually, on this one, the pharos um, is placed over here, not over here. Don't worry about that. Um, on, on the island of Pharos there, but here we go. Um, there's the Pharos. And here, number seven, um, is referred to as the tomb of Alexander in the heart of this wonderful city um, named and based on everything that Alexander the Great was, um, which, which is good. I haven't said wasn't, because he definitely was all of this. Um, and we're looking there and we're thinking it's in the heart. Um, of this wonderful ancient city. Expeditions abound. Do we know what he died from? Um, yes, we do know what he died from, but can I remember? Um, he, dysentery or something. Yeah, <laughs> was it consumption or dysentery? Which isn't too far away. Yeah, um, he, I think he died of dysentery. The, um, I, do, you know, do you know what? Right, I should have done that in my research. I didn't. Naughty cough. Uh, but, but I didn't. Um, but the, the thing is, we, we've got, um, we haven't got any more images now, but what we've got is text. Um, we don't, he, he died of something natural anyway. Some say may have been poisoned. The location of Alexander the Great's tomb is an enduring mystery. Shortly after Alexander the Great's death in Babylon, the possession of his body became a subject of negotiation between all his generals to who was to possess his body. Um... According to a certain uh, writer known as a certain Nicholas Sanders, whilst Babylon was the ob obvious site for Alexander's resting place, some favoured inter um, interring the ruler at Vagina alongside his wonderful father, Philip II, <coughs> um, at Aguia in Vagina, uh, the location of Andronicus's excavations from the 1950s. Aguia was one of the two um, originally proposed resting places, according to Nicholas Sanders. Uh, the other being um, Siwan Oasis. Um, um, however, the body, however, was hijacked en route by Ptolemy I, his most favoured general. His body was hijacked. I want it! According to Porcinus, um, a, a, a writer um, from ancient Greece records for the years um, 321 to 320 BC, Ptolemy initially buried Alexander in Memphis. The location um, of, of, of uh, ancient Egyptian um, learning, Memphis and burial. Um, in the late 300s or the 200s, during the Ptolemaic dynasty, may be buried and the of that coin has now disappeared in um, Gillian's bag. Um, um, the, the body um, was then buried, transferred to Alexandria. Uh, the so-called Alexander sarcophagus, um, uh, weirdly enough, unrelated to Alexander's body and once thought to be the sarcophagus of another leader, is now believed to be that of Marzakas, a Persian governor of Babylon. So they said that he had a sarcophagus in Babylon, but it was actually the sarcophagus of somebody else. So now we go back to um, the very confusing thing. We now go back to Alexandria. So that some people say that his body did actually make it to <coughs> Pagina. Um, according to various writers, Alexander uh, asked shortly before his death to be interred in the Temple of Zeus. Um, Alexander, who uh, requested to be re uh, referred to and perceived as the son of Zeus Ammon, um, enshrining Ammon, did not wish to be buried alongside his father, um, uh, Vagina. Um, we don't really know why. Um, Alexander the body was placed in a coffin of hammered gold. According to um, um, Didorius, uh, who was also a great writer of, of um, a few... Um, Dodorus were, were thinking 
I think Dodorus was writing just before the birth of Christ, don't quote me on this, uh, which was fitted to the body. Um, so we're talking about mummification in a gold case of some kind. The coffin is also mentioned by Strabo, the Roman writer, um, and it writes, the golden coffin uh, was melted down and replaced with that of glass or crystal. Um, I don't know what was the more expensive, the glass or the, or, or the gold. Alexander's, uh, Alexander's wish to be interred um, at Siwa was not honoured. In 321, on its way back to Macedon, the funerary cart uh, was hijacked by um, Ptolemy. Um, in, in late um, 321, Ptolemy diverted the body to Egypt where it was interred um, in Memphis. And obviously we know it ended up at, at Alexandria. According to Plutarch, who visited Alexandria, Alexandria um, the, the, um, there was an oracle there um, who discussed um, that the um, body being in Alexandria was a positive thing indeed. And, and it would ground Alexander, Alexandria as being the place of Alexander, which makes sense, really, doesn't it? Um, it's said, obviously, that his body's moving around and the tomb of Alexander became the focal point of the Ptolemaic cult of Alexander the Great, giving more power and more credence to the city of Alexandria itself. So if we've got Alexander being buried there, uh, then Alex Alexander must be a very great city indeed. And that's probably why he kept, it kept its name. Um, <coughs> now, some historical stuff, um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about the archaeology, and then we'll call it down. Very aware of time, so I'm trying to get through this. In in 48 BC, Alexander's tomb was visited by um, by Caesar um, to finance, um, and it said um, to finance her war against um, Octavian, uh, who eventually became Augustus. Cleopatra took gold from the tomb. Shortly after the death of Cleopatra, Alexander's resting place was visited by Octavian Augusta, the first Roman emperor, emperor, who is said to have placed flowers on the tomb and a golden um, crown upon Alexander's head. Um, according to Suetonius, the Roman writer, Alexander's tomb was then partially looted by Caligula. Mind you, Caligula's got a really bad press. Caligula died, was assassinated in four, AD 41. Um, and um, just before the reign of Claudius. Um, Caligula is said to have reported to have removed the golden breastplate from Alexander the Great. In AD 199, Alexander's tomb was sealed up by Septimus Severus during his visit to Alexandria, uh, the Roman Emperor Septimus Severus. Later in 215, some items from Alexander's tomb were relocated by Caracula, um, the son of uh, Septimus Severus, who was a bit nuts, who forced people like Gillian to eat um, fruit made of stone. And if you didn't eat it, you'd be executed, Gillian. So get used to it. Um, according to a chronicler, John of Antioch, Caracalla removed Alexander's tunic, his ring, um, his belt, um, <laughs> and other items from the coffin. But his body was still there. Um, it said um, there's a certain writer visiting there in AD 400 um, asked... <laughs> if he could see Alexander the, the Great's tomb and, and remarked his, his tomb, even his own people, um, know not where it is. So somewhere around AD 400, it disappeared. Um, it's said that Leo the African in 494 visited Alexandria as a young man and wrote, in the midst of the ruins of Alexandria, there still remains a small edifice built like a chapel, worthy of note. Um, on account of a remarkable tomb held in high honour um, by the Mohammedans, who must have been a local uh, tribe. There's a sepulchre there. They assert is pre uh, preserved um, inside the sepulchre the body of Alexander the Great. An immense crowd of strangers come hither, even from distant countries, for the sake of worshipping and doing homage to the tomb, on which... They likewise frequently uh, bestow considerable donations. So whoever the, the priest was there lived a nice life. Um, a certain George Sanby who visited Alexandria in 1611 was reported uh, to have been shown the sepulchre, uh, venerated still as the rest in peace of Alexander the Great. So this was 1611, so just 400 years ago. 
So we're still there. Love it. Mohammedans, yeah. Oh, God, sorry. The Mohammedans, yeah. Because with all that's said about the um, religion of Islam, right, there can be one said, not in favour, but one said for um, their sense of culture. They wished uh, if culture was of importance um, to pursue that culture with honours. This is why we've got so many Christian churches within the Islamic world still standing uh, at, at the height of the Islamic um, world. And we've got Jewish temples and all the rest of it. So this would have been bestowed with the honour. And so, um, thanks for the correction there, Cathy. Um, um, it, and finally, in ending today, um, two notes. The Egyptian Supreme Council for Antiquities has officially recognised over 140 search attempts for Alexander the Great's tomb, starting in 1815. Uh, by um, an Islamic archaeologist known as Mohammad al-Falahi, who compiled the map of ancient Alexandria, believed Alexandria the tomb is in the centre of Alexandria from the maps. Since then, several other scholars, uh, German um, and other scholars, have placed the tomb in the same area. In 1850, um, an Italian archaeologist announced the discovery of an alleged Alexander's a mummy and tomb inside the mosque of Nabi Daniel um, in 1850. Later, in 1879, a stone worker accidentally broke through the vaulted chamber inside the basement of the, that mosque and saw a great granite monument um, with angular stones. Um, there, an entrance walled up, um, and the stone worker was asked not to disclose the incident. Um, in 1888, an archaeologist whose name none of you will know, a certain Dr. Heinrich Schliemann, attempted to locate Alexander the Great's tomb within the Nabi Daniel Mosque, but was denied permission from the Ottoman authorities. Finally, in 1995, Greek archaeologist Liana Suz um, um, Valsi announced she identified one alleged tomb in Siwa with that of Alexander. So not in Alexander, um, Alexandria at all. The claim was put um, in doubt um, by the then General Secretary of Greek Ministry of Culture, George Thomas, who said that it was unclear if the tomb structure is even, uh, the structure is even a tomb. So go back to um, Alexandria. Uh, so according to one legend, the body lies in a crypt at, uh, beneath an early Christian church, um, not in Alexandria. But some say in Greece, um, a church known as Amythopolis um, has once in 2014 um, again invited speculation about Alexander's final resting place. Some have speculated that it was built for Alexander but never used um, due to Ptolemy seizing the body. So there was a tomb for Alexander the Great in Greece, but it was never used. So you're going to see Carvin saying this is the tomb of Alexander the Great, but the body was never ever taken there. Yeah. Um, and they suggest that the Roman Emperor Caracalla, a great admirer of Alexander, may have had his body in, reinterred in an um in, in his reign. So that paints a different image of Caracalla altogether. Mm -hmm. If Caracalla removed the body and took all the items to be buried in Greece, um, he didn't steal the artefacts at all. But Caracalla is one of those Roman emperors who's truly blackened. Um, it's said, finally, uh, the discovery of a large Alexandrian tomb in Aminopolis, Aminopolis in Macedonia, Greece, has once again invited speculation about Alexander's final resting place. Some have speculated it was built by Alexander, as we've already said. A uh, skeleton being found was um, discovered there within the tomb. Um, it's uh, full examination is expected, but we have not got a DNA of the bones yet. But if the DNA directly linked to that of Philip II, the true resting place of Alexander the Great would definitely bestowed, be bestowed upon Amenopolis. And in fact, Caracalla took it there for safe keeping. And uh, lots of little bits of history can be rewritten. <coughs> uh, finally, if you, if the other thing as well is, um, if any of you have ever seen the film, um, 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 
the last crusade the indiana jones film it puts the bones of alexander the great in venice um but then again that's taken a bit too far what we're going to do now we're going to call it a day hopefully you've all enjoyed today um you can thank kathy for coming up with the idea of doing this class i will finally thank her um um saying that this was an okay lecture after all i think it was have you all enjoyed today yeah. thank you Let's have questions. If there's only one question, we'll go with you, Peter. No kids from this day? Father? No kids? No sons? Um, there were offspring, but there were offspring, but none of them um, uh, really inherited um, the great empire of Alexander the Great. But that's another question altogether. There's some doubts over that. Some doubts over that. Go on, Keith. Have they looked under the car park? Uh, not yet, but it may be found in Barry. If you've all enjoyed that today, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Anyway, lovely. I'll, be, I'll, I'll we'll come back now. Chris, I'll see you next week, yeah? Take care, Chris. Have you enjoyed it today? See you, Chris. Bye bye. Enjoy. Don't get thrown no, by the back. Bye. <laughs> Kathy, let's have your question. You get the last question. Well, he, he was gay and he had a boyfriend. Um, but he did have offspring. I don't know. He had a wife and he had yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. Well, it would have, but I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to avoid um, him being gay because lots of. Greek soldiers were gay as well. It really meant well, no well, nothing. Well, yes. Where did the boyfriend die? Didn't he die on the way somewhere? Oh yeah, he was devastated. Yes. 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 Died before battle. Absolutely the devastated. Boyfriend. This is another. I thought I heard of being the perhaps I'm actually sure his boyfriend in a rain drop from the hat. Oh God. I I think this is another question. And what I'll do next week, we'll 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 look at Alexander the Alexander's family next week. Uh, that's what we'll do next week. Um, date? It's um, no, good questions. It's the um, 15th. 15th. Don't forget about us. Well, your goth will be sitting in your seat instead. So don't worry about it. Apparently, there there are more there are more reported snow things, and there's um, lot, lots of the north is is congested with snow at this minute. Yeah, but Lancashire don't count. Um, if there's no more questions, um, thank you very much, everybody, and I will see you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.